So a process model of, med of mindfulness meditation that we've been working on is the following. The intention might be multi-leveled. Oh, I want to reduce my stress, or I'd like to reduce the symptoms, uh, symptoms that I'm experiencing of anxiety or depression. It could be used as a means of increasing well-being in people who do not have the psychopathology. And then it could also be a sense of a tool that can be used for self-exploration. How does my mind work? Where, where do I get stuck and, um, and how can I become unstuck? So using the breath, one of the most common and powerful uh, objects for meditation, clearly we focus our attention on the breath and uh, when that's working, that can be a basis for developing concentration, open awareness, a sense of calm, perhaps, perhaps even a, a feeling or a state of flow. But inevitably, try as we may, uh, we become distracted. And distraction is very important because that's a place where a lot of learning occurs. Uh, distraction can lead to either ruminating, worrying, oh, I'm not doing this right, I'm never going to be good at meditation, mindless wandering, which is a way of actually engaging in avoidance, as is fantasizing, dozing, or lethargy, or even falling asleep. These are all different forms of uh, distraction, bringing the mind away from the present moment. However, with attentional focus, we can regain attentional focus by reorienting, reapplying our attention. <clears throat> and in that key moment, there is an attitude of either self-judgment, I'm no good at this, or self-criticism, or just the opposite, a sense of kindness, compassion, or even curiosity about how my mind becomes distracted and how I can bring it back. And this leads back to the breath the object of meditation. So this is one way of conceptualizing the process of attending, becoming distracted, and then regaining attentional focus. This Japanese uh, symbol for mindfulness is interesting because it really shows uh, that, at least from this pers perspective, it includes a sense of awareness in the heart and mind. What mindfulness is not is equally important to delineate. It's not distraction. It's not suppression of emotion experience or behavior. It's not avoidance of the present moment, thoughts, feelings, sensations. It's not ruminating or spinning in the cog or cogitating. It's not cognitive reappraisal or cognitive restructuring of emotion. But then what actually are, might be the mechanisms? Well, Zindel Siegel and others have proposed decentering, decentering, disidentifying with the contents of thought and emotions. So that as thoughts and emotions arise, not identifying that this is me. So this is what's meant by decentering. Um, enhancing attentional focus, literally the muscle of attention, the ability to apply one's attention willfully. It's also been considered that one of the mechanisms of uh, treatment effects are, is the ability to enhance one's regulation of emotion. Furthermore, shifts in self-view, going from more negative to perhaps a more positive view of the self, or even shifting the way that we conceive of self um, as an, another possible mechanism for mindfulness. And then reducing negative self-focused rumination. So one study that uh, my wife Vivica Ramel did in, uh, a few years ago, which now has been replicated in another sample, is literally showing that from pre to post MBSR compared to weightless controls, there is a reduction in negative self-focused rumination or negative rumination. Uh, this has been, been done in, this was actually in a sample of uh, adults with major depression and anxiety. Uh, this has also been replicated in um, a healthy college and graduate student sample. Um, so clearly, mindfulness practice is impacting the tendency to spin into negative thinking patterns. Furthermore, in this particular study, the amount of meditation practiced over two months predicted 15% uh, of the reduction in rumination. Small but significant amount of um, var variance in rumination. Next, I'd like to shift to, well, how can we bring this mindfulness practice as a, some type of intervention for adults with social anxiety disorder. Social anxiety disorder uh, has a very large lifetime prevalence. 
about roughly 12% of adults in North America. It's the third most common psychiatric disorder or condition after alcohol, substance abuse, major depression. It has a very early onset. In fact, 80% of the cases tend to uh, um, have their onset before age 18, but they're often not diagnosed. Equally important is that social anxiety usually precedes the subsequent development of major depression, substance abuse, and other anxiety disorders. Hence, it's very important to be able to uh, diagnose and treat um, social anxiety at earlier and earlier stages of development. And social anxiety is associated with the highest high school or gymnasiat dropout rate of all of the anxiety disorders. For all the people who come into our lab and into our studies, we ask everyone to identify three to four specific autobiographical social or performance situations and to compose a single paragraph describing what happened, what they thought, what they felt. So this is to give you a taste of the phenomenology. One client that I worked with says, at a job I had about six years ago, I was supposed to introduce myself to a group of five or six new employees. The president of the company was speaking first, and then I was supposed to say a few words. My anxiety grew to such a heightened level right before I had to get up to speak that I needed to leave the room and the building. I had to take a walk, for about half an hour before I even got up the courage to go back into the building to admit to my manager what I had done and how I had failed. So we literally use these autobiographical scripts as stimuli in the MR scanner to induce uh, as an emotion induction procedure and also to induce memory for specific painful autobiographical social memories. In addition to the script, we ask uh, the, uh, each of our clients to identify four to five negative self-beliefs, automatic negative self-beliefs associated with themselves in that particular social situation. So this client offered, what's wrong with me? Why do I get so nervous? I'm going to get fired for not being able to do this. The pre president must think I'm an idiot and wonder why they hired me if I can't even speak to a few people. If I get up there, I'm going to blush and either throw up or pass out. So you can see how these negative beliefs refer to cognitive distortions about the future, about how other people think about me, and even to fear of physiological arousal that might be uncontrolled. So one of the cognitive models that's been proposed by Clark and McManus and others says that in a social situation, this leads to a distorted view of the self the social self, which then leads to very rapid appraisals of the, of the current situation as dangerous to me, threatening, which then rapidly shifts attention to self-focused processing. And that then subsequently leads to behaviors, safety behaviors like avoidance, uh, escape, somatic or bodily concerns, physiological arousal, and then cognitive symptoms like negative beliefs, um, and self-destructive thinking and interpreting patterns. Here we're going to be focusing on specifically on the attentional shift aspect of um, social anxiety. 